Welcome, everybody. We're streaming, streaming live from Oakland. We have about 10 people in the room in person and 136 people who've registered online from all over the US and even internationally. So we're really excited to have you. And today we're going to cover our blueprint for increasing worker ownership in low income communities, how to replicate a regional approach to economic development through the lens of cooperative ownership. Today's agenda is going to cover introductions, who we are as organizations, and how we've been involved with this project, why we're pushing for a blueprint for worker ownership, elements of our blueprint strategy, what we learned from the past year of our project, the resources we've created through this project, and our next steps from here. Please save your questions. We'll have time at the end to answer them. So to start off, my name is Sushil Jacob, and I'm a staff attorney at the East Bay Community Law Center, where I direct the Green Collar Communities Clinic, which is a community economic development clinic that's focused on providing legal resources, education, and advice to groups of workers and community organizations who are seeking to create cooperative businesses. And my name is Allison Lingain. I'm co-founder of Project Equity, along with Hilary Abel, who is could not join us today, but she sends her best wishes. And Project Equity, our mission is to foster economic resiliency with low-income communities. And we do that by demonstrating and replicating strategies that increase worker ownership. And we're super excited about the Bay Area Blueprint because not only did it kick off really um, a blueprint for the Bay Area as a whole, but it also helped us as an organization to um, create our own organizational blueprint for where we'll go from here. And my name is Ricardo Nunez. I'm a uh, Cooperatives Program Director at the Sustainable Economies Law Center. SELC's mission is to provide uh, legal education, research, advocacy, and legal advice for just and resilient local economies. So that can take many forms, one um, being worker cooperatives, but others. other initiatives of ours are to enable community-owned renewable energy, to uh, micro-food enterprises, as well as advocacy work um, like our current National Save seed sharing campaign. Yeah, great. Thank you, everybody. So let's start off with why do we want a blueprint for worker ownership? First of all, to clarify, what do we mean by blueprint? Blueprint is a term we're using as a group to talk about a plan that we have and we're developing currently to advance worker ownership. But why worker ownership? Well, there's a lot of increased attention right now to the problem of rising economic inequality in our country, both wealth inequality, vast disparity in wealth inequality, as well as income inequality. And you can break that down across many lines of race, um, geography, gender. We have a simple statistic that we're putting up here in front of you all today um, that we think highlights a big structural problem in our economy, which is that our economy is no longer working for a lot of people. And it's no longer designed to support a large and thriving middle class. And this statistic that we have up there is that um, if you look at what would be called the basic family wage, which is $18.15 an hour in California, that's a wage that covers uh, food, shelter, health care, and transportation. About 45% of working adults in our region, the East Bay of California, earn below the basic family wage. Now take a step back and just think about that. Almost half of working adults in this region don't even earn a basic family wage. What we're saying is we need to start thinking about more fundamental ways to restructure our economy. And we're looking at the level of individual businesses and looking to restructure business ownership to increase employee ownership as a means of building wealth and long-term security for workers through what we call worker-owned cooperatives. So what are worker-owned cooperatives? Well, worker-owned cooperatives are actually a combination of two long-recognized social business, social enter enterprise models. The first are cooperatives. Cooperatives are businesses that operate for the benefit of their members and are owned by their members. The second is employee ownership. Employee ownership can take various forms and people might have heard of ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, stock options. A lot of folks working in Silicon Valley and the tech industry are familiar with stock options for um, highly paid, high skilled employees. Well, we're talking about ownership employee ownership for all types of workers. And that's where we come into the idea of a worker-owned cooperative. And in short, a worker-owned cooperative is a cooperative business that is owned and controlled by its workers 
And by control, we mean workers have a voice in the governance and election of the directors of that corporation. So why do we want to do this? What are some of the benefits? There are benefits on three levels that we, we'd like to discuss. First is to the individual workers themselves, to the businesses in which they work, and to the larger society and the economy. For the level of workers, many studies have shown that in worker-owned cooperatives, uh, workers receive better pay and benefits. They're able to build assets over the long term, and they have a voice in key decisions. The businesses themselves benefit because they see higher productivity and growth, um, improved business longevity, better response to economic downturns and economic crises, and lower employee turnover. Yeah, and actually we wanted to just share share um, a quick story about a, the largest worker co-op in the country, which is Cooperative Home Care Associates. They're in the Bronx. They have 2,300 workers. They're in the home health care industry, which is an industry that has very low pay and poor working conditions. Um, and they're actively working to change that. But in that industry, a typical company needs to replace between 40 and 50% of their workforce every single year. They've got really high turnover. At, at CHCA, they've, at the cooperative, they've got only a 10% annual employee turnover. So think about that for a minute. That's a real benefit to the business. They don't have to replace all those employees. That's a lot of work, a lot of cost. A real benefit to their clients who don't have their um, health care, health, health service providers um, turning over so quickly. And it really demonstrates that for the workers, these are better jobs because they're sticking around and they're, and they're staying and they're not leaving. Thank you, Allison. Um, and finally, we want to talk about at the societal level, why do we want worker ownership? Well, the first is worker ownership is a really powerful way to address rising wealth and income inequality when workers have an ownership stake in successful businesses. Another one is the fact that worker co-ops tend to be locally owned and spend their money locally rather than sending um, money to large corporate chains or uh, profits to uh, distant shareholders. This, this leads to what's called a local spending multiplier, which can be really powerful as a ec uh, regional economic development strategy. Uh, worker members of worker cooperatives have demonstrated higher civic engagement a greater participation in local politics and voting. And finally, finally, there's, finally, there's, a, finally there's, a there's a correlation with many other benefits, including um, regions with high percentages of worker ownership have co correlated lower crime rates and increased health outcomes. So these are just uh, some of the reasons why worker ownership is something we should all be thinking about and thinking about advancing as part of an economic development strategy. Next, we want to turn to elements of the blueprint that we've been working on for the past year. So I'll hand it over to Allison. Okay, so we know that we have a big problem in our society um, demonstrated by wage and wealth gaps. We know that worker co-ops are a really important part of that solution. And so we have this vision that many share, which is worker-owned co-ops that build community wealth at scale. And you know, when we think about how to, how to get, how to move towards that vision, uh, when we sat down at Project Equity and we started to think about that, you know, it seems like there was one magical yellow brick road, which was let's just start up more new businesses that are organized as worker co-ops and we'll grow them to be big players in our economy. But as we really thought more deeply about it, in fact, there are multiple pathways to get to that vision. And each one of those pathways plays an important role in the economy. So we can start and grow businesses that are designed and will likely stay small. Small businesses are an important engine of our economy. We can start and grow businesses that are designed to get larger, high growth startups. So these are sometimes referred to as gazelles. And these, in fact, are the, are the types of businesses that create the most new jobs overall. There was a study done by the Kauffman Foundation um, that showed that the fastest growing young firms account for less than 1% of all companies in the economy, and yet they generate 10% of new jobs each year. So, High growing, uh, fast growing startups are a really important component. And then the third pathway is if we look out into the landscape of existing businesses, there's an ocean of existing businesses out there already. And what if we could transition or convert just a portion of those businesses into worker owned co ops? And so, really, our guiding question was how can we accelerate growth along any or all of these pathways? And out of that, the Bay Area Blueprint was born. So focused on increasing worker ownership in low income communities, the Bay Area Blueprint is a year long project that has one pilot program 
the Worker Co-op Academy focused on small-scale co-op entrepreneurship, and two actionable feasibility studies focused on the scale strategies of um, scalable co-op incubation plan and a business conversion assessment. And you know, this is something that we, we knew we couldn't do alone. So as our three organizations um, came together, Project Equity Sustainable Economies Law Center and the, and the East Bay Community Law Center, we, um, you know, we started planning the blueprint and we came across a potential funding source where we had three weeks from when we heard about it until when the application was due. And um, when we reached out to potential partners across different sectors, and when we reached out for letters of support, we just had an incredible, um, incredible backing by a large range of organizations, um, including the ones listed here. Sustainable Business Alliance is a named partner in the grant. Uh, they represent the small businesses in our community. They're a local Valley affiliate, and they really helped us a lot on the conversion research. The U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops and this, its sister organization, the Democracy at Work Institute, that are both national organizations. Um, the U.S. Federation is a membership organization for co-ops, and, and DAWI is a national field building organization focused on increasing co-ops in low-income communities. And then our local community college, Laney College, uh, was instrumental really in the um, Worker Co-op Academy, both in hosting the program and, and will we'll tell you more about the curriculum that uh, will become a Laney course. And so this outpouring that we got, both in terms of named partners, but also across um, letters of support came from two of our Two local city economic development, um, different cities officials, our county, Alameda County Social Service Agency, a number of CBOs, a number of local co-ops, a leading B Corp. Um, so really there's there's a hunger for this kind of a plan to be put in place. And next we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned through this process. So the first, um, first component of the strategy that we'll talk about is the Worker Co-op Academy. So this was a 12-week um, course at Laney College, um, uh, which is based in Oakland, California. And some of the things that we learned about putting on this first academy, this pilot, was that there was a demand. There was three times the number of applicants than the spaces that we were offering. So that's three times the businesses, the nonprofit organizations that, were that want to develop worker cooperatives, um, existing cooperatives that want to strengthen their internal structure and look to growth and expansion for themselves. We had three times as many of those apply than, than we actually had spots for. So there's definitely a demand in the marketplace um, that, that we were that we saw. Um, another is another lesson learned was that um, really focusing in with each uh, co-op, we asked each co-op in the academy to focus on a strategic project that addressed a certain um, element or issue or a strategy within their business that they could work on and that they would focus in on throughout the entire academy so that they really that there was some chink in their armor that they were trying to address that we really figured out a way to um, with them through the trainings through the different modules but also with um, some one-on-one -on -one, um, business consultations and mentorship to really figure out how to overcome those hurdles so that each of them whether they were nonprofits looking at their development model or whether they were uh, existing businesses that were converting to worker ownership, how do they do that? What's the actual strategy and steps to do that? Um, and that was a really valuable uh, tool that, that we found. Um, another key component of the academy was that we included our local um, co-op community. So not only did we reach out to uh, the network of Bay Area worker cooperatives, which is a trade association of worker owned businesses here in the Bay Area, um, but we also uh, looked at the US Federation and tried to engage the, the co-op community here in the Bay Area to see who would like to mentor, who can come in to talk to the academy participants, who can share their stories um, and show the, the strength and viability of the cooperative business model. Um, we also went on a half-day site visit to Alvarado Street Bakery, which is a large worker-owned business, um, one of the largest on the West Coast uh, in Petaluma, California. And so that these teams, even though they were small co-op entrepreneur um, businesses, uh, that that they could look at um, Alvarado Street and see a history where they where Alvarado Street also started as a small cooperative and has grown now to over 120 worker owners. Um, and so to look at that as a scalable model 
for themselves, um, thinking about that right now as they're starting off their businesses, converting their businesses, or strengthening internally. And also, uh, we just like to thank Rainbow Grocery. Rainbow Grocery is the largest worker cooperative um, business on the West Coast. Um, it's a grocery store based in San Francisco, California, and they were generous and, and supplied us with a grant to, to fund part of this Worker Co-op Academy. So we really appreciate that and hopefully that, uh, that support can continue into the future. And, and the last piece I'd like to talk about is that there were seven teams in the um, academy. One is pictured here, um, Mandela Foods Cooperative, which is uh, a worker-owned grocery store in West Oakland. But um, that these teams, after they graduated, that wasn't the end of our relationship with them. That afterward, they had um, each of the teams applied and four were chosen for ongoing business consultation um, and coaching with Project Equity. And six were given um, ongoing legal counsel by uh, the Green Collar Communities Clinic, uh, Sushil's um, legal clinic at the East Bay Community Law Center. So we were really looking at um, the other academies and business um, co-op business incubator um, programs or institutes around the country and trying to see where was the key component for them that was a, a stumbling block um, within those academies. And a lot of times people talked about how they needed more ongoing support after a 12 week or how many ever week intensive business um, and co-op education course. So that's something that we were trying to address here with our um, with our academy. Um, and we also uh, another point that we'd like to talk about is that we had a mixture of uh, of types in our academy. So. Um, this was a pilot. We were just trying to put as many ideas out there and see what would work, where we could add the most value. And um, instead of just focusing on startups, instead of just focusing on conversions, we had um, startups, conversions, so existing businesses looking to worker ownership. Um, we had nonprofit developers looking to incorporate uh, worker ownership into their workforce development programming, as well as um, an existing cooperative that was looking to um, strengthen its structures or actually create some new structures that will strengthen the business um, for expansion. And it was um, it was not it was difficult for us to create a curriculum that could identify and speak to the needs of each of these stakeholders. But on the flip side, there was um, a vast amount of cross pollination. So the existing businesses that um, have years of experience under their belt were able to provide provide that type of um, business uh, sort of mentorship to the startup and to the um, cooperative to, to really let them know about the lessons that they learned. And on the, on the other side of that, the cooperative, uh, people who've been in cooperatives for a long time were able to share their lessons learned, how they dealt with issues and problems, hiring and firing, really, um, you know, those basic questions that are very difficult to answer for, for when you're transitioning into worker ownership where workers have the control. Um, and then also another inspiring piece about uh, the academy was that all of the participants, whether they were for-profit or non-profit, had a mission underlying their, their uh, enterprise and it was to and building better communities. So from access to fresh food to um, sustainable landscaping, we're in a drought right now in California, one of the worst in our history. And, and, and looking at that as well as um, holistic health and how low-income communities can access um, holistic health op opportunities. <laughs> All of these within our academy, um, the participants within our academy were really inspiring, um, not only for their vision of worker ownership, but also the services that they were bringing to their communities. Um, and here are just some uh, uh, points that are, are quotes from our, some of our participants. And really, it just shows that um, since it was a pilot, we did ask for feedback and we did receive a lot of feedback that we could really um, uh, get our teeth into to refine and retool for the next academy. Um, but one of the um, one of the strings that kind of uh, was threading through all of the different um, feedback that we received was that this is a this is an academy. This is an educational opportunity that needs to continue to exist um, in our local community in our area. This is something that um, has been needed and wanted for a long time, and that uh, that needs to continue into the future. So. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about um, the scale, the first scale strategy, scaling a cooperative incubation plan. So. Great. Thanks, Ricardo. <clears throat> so, so again, uh, picture in your mind these gazelles, these high, fast-growing startups. Um, as, we started, as we approached this feasibility study, we initially 
started off thinking that really our goal was to identify within the Bay Area economy what the key industries or industry would be that would would really lend itself um, the most to this to the strategy of starting up um, co-ops that were designed to grow. And as we got into it, what we realized is that we're very lucky in the Bay Area and that we live in really a um, you know a thriving local economy, especially especially now. Um, and that there really are opportunities and business ideas across many different industries. And so what we really want to share with you today is a set of tools and a way of thinking about what um, selecting the businesses that are ultimately going to be the strongest fit for this type of work. <clears throat> so we started off um, by putting together what we call our business fit scorecard. And this scorecard ranks, helps you to rank different business ideas for both social impact and business feasibility and does it across three different buckets. So job creation, so is this a business that, that can, can grow big enough, that it can create 50 to 100 good jobs at maturity, and can it do that fairly quickly, or is it gonna take 30 years to get to 50 jobs? And then what portion of the total jobs are available to entry level LMI workers? Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's really important given, given this, the social mission here. And then the quality of jobs, you know, we've talked about co-ops having higher quality jobs. And so what is it about this particular business idea? Does the margin sustain being able to pay higher than industry average wages if you, if, you know, you're spreading the profit around to all of the, all of the workers? Um, what's the professional growth potential, career laddering, and so on and so forth. And then the third bucket is business characteristics. So you absolutely have to build a strong business. Um, without a strong business, you don't have a strong co-op, and without a strong co-op, you don't have um, any of any of the ripple effects through uh, to the workers, the business itself, or through society. So the first and most important thing under the business characteristic is what's the competitive advantage? What is going to make this business be able to compete and succeed and grow? Absolutely critical. And then related to that, is there a potential? It's not a requirement, but is there a potential for there to be mission contracts with mission aligned um, purchasers? Those could be anchor institutions. Those could be, you know, mission aligned businesses. We often think, think, talk about sweetheart clients being a key to helping new businesses really get a foothold. And then finally, what are the startup requirements, um, both in terms of capital requirements and then the, the cost to sustain the business until it hits break even? And so we actually created an Excel spreadsheet that has the ability to weight these different factors um, that, you know, you could take this spreadsheet and put your own weightings into it and then to score it based upon a rubric that we put together for each of the areas. It does take into account some additional um, characteristics as well, and this would be a resource that we'd be happy to share, share with folks if they were interested in using it. So, um, so that's the Business Fit Scorecard. And then we looked at the, we did an analysis of Bay Area industries and, and sectors. And we, um, the nine, I won't read these out here, but these are the nine industries or subsectors that we looked at. Um, and we developed detailed reports on five of them. And through that process, we interviewed nearly 50 individuals, um, spoke with, a you know, obviously a bunch of folks. Um, and as I said, we feel like there are opportunities in each of these sectors. Um, some of them, depending on your goals, um, especially if you have particular goals in terms of workforce that you're trying to engage, male versus female, you know, male is going to be more logistics and transportation, female is going to be more healthcare. So, so as thinking of this as a tool for folks, you want to be able to bring those things to light. And as we continue to have more conversations with people, um, a number of other um, considerations for selecting businesses also came to light. So one of them is the presence of quality job training programs. So you can start up your co-op and if your workers need training, you can train them yourselves or you can pull them out of a partnered job training program. So um, tech, networking tech services was on, on the list on the previous slide and that was in large part because there's a really great job training program in Oakland, the Stride Center that works on, um, that provides a six month job training program. So we could imagine partnering with them and creating a co-op in the tech services space. The mission focus of the business, really great, really important for you know, both aligning your, um, get, getting, getting the participants, getting the workers more excited about the business, but also thinking about pulling in investors or supporters or, or other, um, other folks and getting support for that. And then just thinking about the local co-op community. So what are the ways that that co-op community can support? You know, there's the just straightforward ways from advice and mentorship but are there um, buying opportunities? Are there partnership opportunities? Are there 
uh, joint purchasing opportunities that could be could be created? And then are there unique, unique and creative ways to think about this connection to market? And so coming out of this, we, um, we sort of highlighted two business ideas in order to demonstrate these two different ways, um, kind of two kind of big picture conceptual ways to think about this connection to market. So at, just if I'm starting up a normal, any kind of business, work a co-op or not, you wanna think about what is your differentiated offering? What's your competitive advantage? What's, you know, you have market demand, but how are you as a company gonna stand out? How are you gonna be different, right? Um, and so we looked at the stormwater, stormwater space, and I'm gonna try and explain this at a, at a high level, and forgive me, I'm gonna gloss over a bunch of details, but um, the stormwater industry, in, in quotes, um, exists basically because we, as we continue to pave over more of our cities, when it rains, that rainwater takes all of the pollutants that are on all that cement and roadway and pulls that drops them into the bay, creating pollution in the bay. So there's been a number of um, uh, regulations passed that say for big developments, you have to figure out how to not let all that stormwater run off, but instead have it percolate into the soil. So engineers have come in and figured out, you know, technical solutions to making that happen and how to build that. Now, in this space, there isn't a company, there is not an existing company that takes that technical solution and makes it pretty. <laughs> so a, a, differentiated, uh, a differentiated offering in the stormwater space would be, a, would be a technical solution that also has a very deep design aesthetic. So that's an example of, of how to create a competitive advantage just on the um, merits of the business idea alone. The second way is to really focus in on, on anchor clients or mission aligned mission aligned businesses. And this idea came out of the green building space. So this is LED lighting retrofits. The idea is that if you got if you pay for a lot of lights, so you have big parking structures, you have large buildings, um, it's a big part of your expense. And so if you go in and you replace your incandescent light bulbs with LED, you can get significant cost savings. It actually pays for the cost of the retrofit itself. So if you could imagine um, with having a plan to start up a worker co-op in this space and going and, and talking to all of the local governments, all of the local educational institutions, and figuring out the ones you can partner with in order to, to get this business off the ground, that would be a way to, to really focus in on the anchor, anchor client approach. So just two examples of many, many, many business ideas that could exist in a thriving Bay Area economy, um, really to demonstrate this, these different approaches to connection to market. Okay, so oh, that was our gazelles, and now we're gonna talk about business conversion assessment and what we learned there. So why do we wanna focus on that great ocean of businesses that are out there and transitioning into, um, into worker co-ops? You know, at the end of the day, we feel like the risk of converting a business that's already thriving, it's already profitable, already established into a worker co-op, you, you have cultural and operational changes that need to take place, but if you compare that to the risk of also setting up the cultural and operational um, systems to be a successful worker co-op and getting a business started up, the risk is just lower. Um, so can we find those businesses? And, and we're going to talk about succession planning, the baby boomer retirement wave, and um, the Bay Area social, socially responsible businesses on the slides to come. So um, the Ohio Employee Ownership Center, which is an amazing organization, obviously in Ohio, <laughs> um, they have some stats, and these are, I think, about 10 years old now, um, and their previous stats were from 20 years ago and were, uh, were better than this, so my guess is that today's numbers are, are even worse than, than what we have up here, but which is family-owned businesses, only 15% of those succeeded the second generation. So out of every 100 businesses, 85 of them do not go to the children, and 95 of them don't make the third generation. And so a lot of them just go away disappear. <laughs> These are good family-owned businesses in our communities that, that go away. Um, and if they don't go away, many of them are sold to out-of-state buyers or private equity firms that, you know, don't have that local, um, local commitment and often will relocate jobs for the entire business. So instead of them either going away, what if they were sold to their employees? Instead of them being sold to out-of-state buyers, what if they were sold to their workers? So combine that stat now with this, this tsunami of the silver tsunami of the baby boomer retirement. So um, trillions of dollars of business value, yes, that is TR, trillions, not millions, um, of business value are forecast to change hands in the next 10, 20 years as a result of this, um, of baby boomers retiring. So, you know, we don't need the whole wave, we just need a little slice of it <laughs> to help co-ops reach scale. 
Um, and it turns out that of private companies that have over 20 employees, two thirds of those companies, two thirds are um, owned by baby boomers. So really big numbers. And as we, we sat down as part of our feasibility study, and this is one of the ways that the Sustainable Business Alliance partnered with us, um, they were able to set up a focus group, and then we had a number of conversations with other, um, other businesses through some of our partners and um, through the Pacific Community Ventures helped us as well. Um, you know, we talked about employee ownership. And so in our focus group is quite interesting. The, uh, the, the business owners, uh, we started off talking about employee ownership, and these were founders and business owners. So we're talking about their baby. And we're, we're starting the conversation to talk about, you know, what it would look like for their employees to own their baby. And, you know, honestly, there was a little bit of squirming going on <laughs> in those chairs. Um, and, and then we switched gears and we talked about what it would look like when they were retiring. So imagine that you are now retiring and what do you want for your business? You want, and you know, on and on the, the conversation really repeated the same themes. We want our, we want our, my business, I want it to be successful. I want the mission to live on. Every business has a mission, even if it's not a, you know, socially responsible business. Every business has a mission. Um, and we want our, our customers to, and our employees and our vendors and our partners to be well taken care of. These are trusted relationships and it's really mattered to us. Um, and so there's this re real fear that, that, uh, that all of these things won't happen when they're selling their business. We were talking to a, a business owner, 72 years old, spent his entire life dedicated to the mission of this company. And he is just scared. He doesn't want to let go at 72 because he's scared that somebody else is going to come in and, and, and run it into the ground. So, okay, so we know business, we know there's a big opportunity, we know business owners, um, there's a real alignment at the point where the business owner is retiring. So what does the landscape of actual businesses look like? So we answered that question um, with, with big help from our summer intern, Shannon, who's actually here in the room with us. Thank you, Shannon. Um, who did a, she did a quantitative analysis of Oakland businesses that showed um, concentration in a few industries. So set out to say, okay, well, we, if we're thinking of low wage workers and what types of businesses we're trying to convert into employee ownership, we want them to be successful businesses, so growing industries, we have a size criteria, so let's at the bottom end say 20, so that we've got with one fell swoop, you know, a decent number, and then up to say 200, we think that could grow as we got more experience with this, and obviously with low wage worker populations. So in Oakland, the target industries are listed here, manufacturing, commercial printing, that was one I wouldn't have thought of, um, logistics and shipping and health services. And then in addition, you know, we've talked about the fact that in the Bay Area, we have just this real concentration of of mission driven companies. And we think that those are companies that are, are already predisposed to really be thinking about serving all of their stakeholder groups, including their employees. And so we think that those types of owners um, are gonna be even more predisposed to employee ownership. So the big takeaway um, from all of this is that there's a, a major opportunity and everybody we talked to, whether it was business owners, whether it was lawyers, CPAs, business associations, nobody knows that this is an option. You know, in our little circles of co-op folks and ESOP folks, like we, of course, it's an option we talk about all the time, but nobody out there knows, it's like the best kept secret. So we need to pull out our megaphones and we need to make sure that people know. A couple of business owners said to me, you know, if I just heard success stories of, of this a couple times a year, you know, heard on the news, saw it in my trade publication, whatever it might be, I, it would be an option that was in my brain when I came, when it came time for me to think about retirement or when you know, one of the businesses in my network, I would bring it up with them. So that's our first thing is we need to help people know about it. And then the second thing is we really need to engage impact investors. So in the nonprofit sector, we need to look to the for-profit sector and see what they do and what can we take and put to good use <laughs> to, solve our, to solve the problems we're trying to address. So there's a private equity. Private equity does a lot of work where they go out there and they try to find businesses and they, they buy them, buy them. And then they grow them, you know, to make them more profitable or combine them with other businesses. So why can't we take that same strategy in the nonprofit sector? Engage impact investors, have a pool of money, go out and identify businesses that could be purchased by them. And, and assuming that there are businesses that the employees are excited to become owners, help transition them through that process to become worker owned. So really important potential strategy for us to take. Yeah, and so thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. That was great. Um, so next, we're going to talk about some resources that are available. So, um, so up we're.
gearing up, uh, like I said earlier, but for the next version of the Worker Co-op Academy, round two is this fall. Um, and we are actively fundraising for this. So if you know of any organizations, foundations, um, individuals who are interested in help, helping us fund the next um, academy, we are still looking for funding to be able to provide this um, in the Bay Area and continue it on um, as long as we can go. Um, another, oh, and also that applications, like I already mentioned, applications will be available um, at the end of May for to apply. And we're going to be doing a team academy again. So um, no individuals um, can apply, but already pre-selected existing businesses or teams um, are uh, encouraged to apply. We also have uh, Think Outside the Boss, our half-day workshop on how to start a worker-owned business um, that's put on by Selk and GC3. This uh, upcoming, we are upcoming Think Outside the Boss is on April 18th in San Jose. It's part of um, a day-long conference on cooperatives and economic democracy. Um, and you can go to our website and find the event, or the selk.org, you can find the event um, and save the date for that. We also will be publishing our curriculum uh, from the first Worker Co-op Academy. We're going to be refining it and um, incorporating some more material so that it's actually, when we publish it, it, it can be used by other people. So you'll actually know um, what we're trying to say when we, when we ourselves just wrote a little line, a note to ourselves to remember to talk about something, that you actually have that content in the curriculum. Um, and we are also, uh, our academy is going through the accredited, or at least the curriculum from the academy is going through the accreditation process at Laney College, which is a local community college here in Oakland, California. And um, what was it? That process, the accreditation process can take up to two years, but we're now um, approved as a fee-based course at Laney College. And once the college sees that there's actual interest and in people coming um, and attending the course, then they'll move it forward in the accreditation process. And our hope is that we will have this approved and accredited for college um, credit across California. So once that happens, any community college in California will be able to take our curriculum and um, facilitate or offer that class um, in their local communities. So that's something that we're also working toward. Um, and then we also have cooplaw.org, which is an online legal resource website um, that was uh, co-created by Selk and GC3. And there's just tons of information on there from employment law to financing your cooperative to um, bylaws and articles of incorporation um, so that you can go there and see that you don't have to create the wheel or recreate the wheel, that all of these resources um, around the legal issues confronting worker-owned businesses exist. Um, and we try to write it in as plain English as possible. And we also have some Spanish material um, there as well. So those are some uh, resources related to cooperative education. Um, yeah. Great. And so then coming out of the um, out of the blueprint on the two scale strategies. So I talked about the business fit scorecard. Happy to make that available to anyone who wants to use it. Um, you know, contact information will be at the end. So please feel free to email. Um, and let me know. And also similar with the written industry and sector assessments, these are obviously Bay Area specific. Um, and then for those of you who haven't already seen, um, there's a white paper published by my co-founder, written by my co-founder Hilary Abel and published by the Democracy Collaborative uh, coming up on a year ago now, which really looks at worker co-ops at the 20,000 foot level across the whole United States and says, what are the, what are the barriers to scale and the, and the pathways to scale? And then, Thinking about conversions, the so we talked about the um, the Oakland business assessment, the quantitative assessment of Oakland businesses. So that methodology, we're happy to share that with you if you want to take that and apply it in your city or your region. And we also have an outreach plan that we've put together for engaging um, all of these different actors, the, the owners, the employers, investors, and professional service advisors. And coming uh, soon, being released in early April by Project Equity, is a set of a uh, dozen case studies of businesses that have converted. And we've pulled out of that a set of readiness factors. So if you're uh, you're thinking about, is this a business a good candidate for conversion to worker ownership, that'll be a really good resource for you to look at. Not only think about the readiness factors, but also to, to get your head around, like, what are the nuts and bolts of, of how co-ops have actually, businesses have actually gone through um, this, this process of conversion. 
And then our three organizations, Project Equity, SELC, and uh, East Bay Community Law Center, will be publishing a guide to worker co-ops later this year. So we're trying to do this in a way, so imagine you go to the library and you get a book on uh, how to set up my sole proprietorship. Very easy to read, easy to access, tear out sheets, you know, ours will be uh, elect electronic tear out sheets, but designed to try and really demystify what this process looks like. Um, and we're working on that right now and it, sh it should be available later this year. So next steps from here, what does it look like to implement the blueprint? So we've talked about the Worker Co-op Academy um, and that round two in the fall and the, the Laney curriculum. And then on the two scale strategies, Project Equity's focus in the coming year will be on the business conversion and we'll be launching a co-op conversion incubator and doing this really aggressive pipeline development to try and identify, using our megaphone to identify businesses that are candidates for conversion to worker ownership. And in terms of the scalable incubation plan, um, you know, we're taking a, a slower pace on that front, um, though we might well be opportunistic if, if um, good connection to, op to market opportunities come up and then we'll pick that up in more focus in a more focused way in the coming years. And then, you know, really when we started the blueprint, we didn't have in our mind that we were potentially moving towards a collective impact strategy. Um, but, you know, as, as we pulled in these folks from different sectors and really found that there was a lot of interest from people in being involved in, you know, developing this strategy and then implementing some of the pieces coming out of it, um, we've had a couple of, of meetings with with um, where we pulled in folks across the co-op sector and we've said, you know, what would it look like for us to organize together um, to work collectively to try and drive larger scale systems change within the Bay Area. So we feel like we're in the nascent efforts of organizing a collective impact effort and SELC and Project Equity are spearheading that effort. Um, and so we'll be, be kind of pu pulling that together in, in the year as the year unfolds. Um, well, uh, in terms of creating infrastructure for worker cooperatives to, to thrive and flourish, SELC and ECLC are sponsoring a bill this year to create a worker cooperative uh, legal entity in California. It'll be um, a subset of existing co-op law for California. Right? So that that bill is being introduced into the assembly as ADP. We'll be working hard on trying to get it passed this year. And uh, if you want, you can sign a petition supporting the uh, supporting the bill AB 816 on SELC's website. There's a petition, and uh, you can just sign right online. Um, and we also have a template uh, letter that you can send to uh, the assembly members in the committees that the uh, bill is going to be passing through. Um, and then the last uh, part or piece, I guess, of implementing a blue this blueprint is um, a city ordinance for the promotion of worker cooperatives. So. SELC has been working on this city ordinance um, for about a year, a little bit more than a year, I believe. And so we finally published it. It's on our website. It's um, on a feedback form. So if you go, you can read it and um, provide questions or comments um, so that we can refine it. But um, it's out there as a template so that other people can take it and use it in their local um, areas and um, uh, for their local circumstances. And we are currently ourselves uh, working with the city of Oakland, a few council members we're um, actively speaking to and interested in incorporating worker cooperatives um, in their economic development strategy here in Oakland. So um, that's a conversation that's still moving forward, but it um, hopefully will bear a lot of fruit and we're really excited about it. So, so uh, we've covered a lot in 40 minutes. Um, and we will have time for questions after this, but just so you know where to go to get more information, there's two websites, um, and we'll be sending out, um, actually, the, this whole slide deck and the link to the audio recording will be on the first website listed, which is Project Equity's um, website, and they have a, a page for the Bay Area Blueprint. There will also eventually be a list of documents that have been um, created through this Blueprint process, and some of them will be available on Project Equity website. SELC has a page on the Worker Co-op Academy with more details on how to apply for round two, and eventually the curriculum will be posted on that website. And then we provide all of our email addresses. So all this will be available through Project Equity's website to download this deck. 
And um, if you RSVP'd, um, everybody who RSVP'd is going to get the link to all this inter the deck and the video recording. And, cool. Yeah. So um, yeah, now we have time for questions. Uh, there's already a stack on online, so I hope the people in the room don't mind if I start there. But um, what was it? Uh, so a question, um, was the curriculum developed and approved by the college or did they just host it? Um, so uh, the curriculum was developed by um, our three organizations. Um, it was not approved at Laney College. Um, we have a uh, advocate or uh, champion there who um, basically helped guide us and deal with the administration at the uh, at the college um, so it was not a co official college course so they didn't have any um, part in developing the curriculum nor was it uh, college accredited yet so that's something that we're working on but Next time around. Yeah. Talk about next time around. Yeah, so next time around, um, we're uh, providing the curriculum to Laney College for the accreditation process. And what we're hoping is that not only will it be a standalone course, but also that they incorporate components of the curriculum into their current business entrepreneurship certificate program. So that anybody going through their business course, uh, maybe they don't take this elective of the worker co-op entrepreneurship you know, of course, but that they still are exposed to the ideas of worker ownership as a viable um, opportunity and business model. So um, the next question is, uh, what do you think of multiple cooperatives under one umbrella foundation like Evergreen or the Mondragon and in, in, uh, Mondragon cooperatives in Spain? Um, this person's from uh, Seattle and they're building. So as they build their co-op in Seattle, they're positioning the infrastructure to scale to help several co-op startups. So, so what do you guys think about that type of model? Um, the Mondragon cooperative model is tried and true. Um, it's one of the most successful models. There's about 120 worker cooperatives that are combined into one large network under a corporation. Um, and we would all aspire to create Mondragons <laughs> here in the US. Um, what, seven, something like 75,000 people yeah, um, for workers, worker. right? So this yeah. is true scale. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the foundation model in the U.S. is it's still in experimental stage. We don't know how, what its success will be. We really hope Evergreen will succeed. Evergreen is a, um, a group of co-ops in, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, where foundation has been a big backer of the creation of them. So they're more top-down driven co-ops. And what we're looking at is what, what's the existing infrastructure in terms of educational institutions that already exist, a community college, in terms of businesses that already exist, and working with them to convert the existing economy and the existing infrastructure to worker ownership. So we have a, a kind of a different approach, and um, that's why we're excited about our approach. Yeah, and one thing I would add to that, which is that one of the real benefits of, of, of a, you know, a system like Mondragon is that there's a, a network so it's it's co-ops helping co-ops, right? And so, you know, you can you can accomplish co-ops helping co-ops in lots of different ways. Um, but then, you know, formalized systems where you've got you've got things like shared money flows that then create funds, pots of money to help with growth capital and startup capital. So that's the level at which you start to start to you know have some some real business um, tools that are available to that network. And so it just becomes a question as to whether or not you can access those tools outside the network or if you need to build a network in order to create those types of supports. Are there any questions in the room before I keep going with uh, the online questions? No. I have one. Yeah, please. I would love to know, I've uh, come from a union background and I haven't even heard the word union and I'm curious mm -hmm. what you guys think about potential for partnerships. Is that a barrier? Is that a pathway? Yeah, I think there's huge potential for partnerships with unions. And in fact, there's a union co-op model that officially um, exists, and there's groups that are, are working under that umbrella. It's with the steel steel workers. Yeah. Um, and Mondragon. With the steel workers and with Mondragon. Um, I was talking about the Cooperative Home Health, uh, Cooperative Healthcare Associates, the largest worker co-op in the U.S. that's located in the Bronx. They're a unionized co-op. Um, and it can bring real benefits to have the union um, as a part of it because of the power of the union out there in the real world, right? So um, what, what's, what that partnership um, has, uh, you know, I'm an, out, I'm an outsider, so I might not get all these details right, but 
um, with CHCA, what that partnership has, I think, it helped helped to uh, to enable is it's helped enable CHCA and the associate there's two associated organizations um, to really be advocates within the industry. So CHCA is um, you know demonstrating the the high road employ employer right the way to do it right. The union is partner with them and they've actually been able to get some some laws and regulations changed to the benefit of workers across the entire industry. So they're really working to raise the floor across the entire industry and um, that partnership with the union has been very helpful. And we're, we're talking to a union right now about sponsoring a group of workers for the union coming in themselves as a mem uh, as participant, as a team in the in the next round of the co-op academy. Um, this next question from David is, how does the private equity model different, uh, differ from traditional conversions, if at all? Are there new mechanisms to facilitate transfer of ownership from private equity to worker owners that you've envisioned or developed? Thinking, thinking. Good question. Um, so question was, how, do, how does this concept of, 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 of bringing investors in and acquiring acquiring a, a business where the employees are excited about becoming worker owners. How is that different from working with the owner and transitioning it through that perspective? Mm -hmm. So I think what it is, is it's, um, yes, there are mechanisms from a finance and legal perspective um, to be thought through, but I think that there's a, um, you're sort of reordering the, the order of events. So if you have an owner who's involved and the owner is willing to stay engaged and involved, that can actually be very ben beneficial to a business that is converting. Because if you, from one to the next, take an owner out, you may also be taking, you know, a lot of the knowledge about how the business runs. You may be take, taking out a, an important role in the business, you know, depending on what roles that owner is still is still playing in the business. Um, so that if the transition of those roles and that knowledge and that just experience in the industry can happen over time, that can be very beneficial to the worker owners that are now um, owning and running the business. So versus if you've got a, an impact investor involved um, and you're coming in and you're the owner's wanting a quick exit, you want to figure out how to try and get as much as you can from that owner before they're gone. Maybe even set up a contract with that owner to keep them engaged um, to help help with that knowledge transfer. Um, but you're kind of making the legal transaction happen first um, and at where the owner leaves. And then you're really working on the cultural transition um, after the transaction happens versus if an owner is still there and engaged, you're working on the cultural transition and then you're doing that legal and financial transaction. And someone from Boston, Aaron um, Tanaka, said that they are they are doing this, they're Boston Ooh. Impact Initiative. Uh, they're a minority stakeholder in a minority owned business and they're planning to sell their shares to the workers over time. Yay. So that's really exciting. <laughs> and a Bali fellow. And a, and Bali, a Bali fellow, nice. excellent. Sweet. Um, the next question from Adam is, uh, do you see shared services co-ops as stepping stone, as a stepping stone to worker co-op development? Are you considering working with purchasing co-ops that have small business members as part of a succession strategy. Hmm. Anybody want to take that? Um, I think shared services co-ops can be a really powerful, a powerful model, as can marketing co-ops. Hmm. Um, and so, just really quickly, what that is is instead of it being a co-op owned by the workers, the the, the business is joined together to support um, a set of services. And the services could be marketing, they could be purchasing. Um, I think that is it. Uh, Ace Hardware, True Value, are um, their marketing, marketing sure. is a marketing co-op. So if you go into an Ace Hardware, they're local, they're locally owned or owned, you know, by individually, but they share the brand and they share the marketing. Um, so there's many ways to share resources, to pool your resources to the benefit of of the larger um, larger folks, and they're they're all can be really powerful and really beneficial. But I think the question was, do we see it as a stepping stone or a pathway? Mm. I mean, it. it could potentially be. Um, yeah, I'd have to think, think about that. I one. think it's, yeah. it. Uh, if you look at the example of Island Employee Co-op mm -hmm. out in Maine, mm -hmm. one of the most recent uh, worker co-op conversions that we've been reading about and writing about, that actually is an Ace Hardware store. Mm -hmm. That so it's part of a larger marketing shared services co-op as a business, but then internally now the founder owner has sold business to the workers so we could I, and maybe that's where this person was going with their question but we could start 
with these uh, associations of small businesses and start converting them one by one to yeah, their, it could be in the same way that mission aligned businesses that could, that could sort of fit in that same category of potentially predisposed to be inter more interested in this concept. That's a great great comment, great question. Uh, next question, uh, I think from Len, if I'm saying that right. Is there any interest in finding out what skills and needs the local neighborhoods and communities have, which could contribute to what co-ops could be, or could or should be started? So um, yeah, this is part of our um, collective impact strategy is to really look and include nonprofit community-based organizations who have relationships in community and know what the communities are really um, asking for and uh, wanting. And so we're working with them to see how can we look at the, um, the supply chain in our communities and how can our local communities with the resources that they already have, how can we figure out what cooperatives need to start or what businesses need to be developed to service those, those needs. Otherwise, that money and the services uh, goes out of the community. So, so that's part of our strategy is really including um, community-based organizations. Yeah, so. and I would just add to that and say that one of the things that, that we feel like the Worker Co-op Academy offers um, in the Bay Area, we have a number of, of really great co-op developers that focus in on, on starting up co-ops, the nonprofits or um, or in Ayers Mendy's case, not, but really focus on growing co-ops kind of within their network. Um, so they've done amazing work and created some amazing co-ops and their system is, is um, sort of a closed system. And the Worker Co-op Academy is designed to be an open system so that we can really be a resource for people and communities to come in and create their own, their own solutions and their own worker co-ops. Um, next question from Afifa is, is there any guidance and support for organizations outside of the Bay Area um, or men mentorship opportunities? Um, so a, a place to start um, would be the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. They have, um, they're the national organization for worker uh, cooperative businesses. And they would be a great place to start if you're if you're somewhere not in the Bay Area or like the Bay Area where there's cooperatives, there's a high concentration of worker ownership, that you can reach out to um, the U.S. Federation and find who is in your local community um, or whether it's um, uh, attorneys or technical assist, other technical assistance providers or um, people interested in cooperatives or those starting cooperative businesses. The Federation will probably have the most comprehensive view of who is in your uh, region or city that knows about cooperatives and that you can connect with. So um, there's also the Sustainable Economies Law Center is developing a social network for attorneys who are interested in um, creating just and resilient local economies. And part of that is worker cooperatives. So right now we're doing some internal testing to get the network up and running. But um, in the near future, we'll be putting it out there. And so if you know of attorneys who are interested in cooperatives, um, but they might not have the background education or, or local um, resources to learn more about it, you can connect through the network and we'll be providing um, CLE, uh, continuing education uh, workshops online for uh, attorneys who are interested in, in uh, supporting cooperative development. So, yeah. Okay. Um, next question from Ann. How many people from each co uh, cooperative or organization attend the, attended the academy? So the smallest teams that we had were um, of two people representing their business um, and the largest we had was four. So um, two to four people representing a, a larger uh, business or organization. Um, let's see. Uh, next from Misty. Could there be consideration for statewide alignment with other cities or academic institutions? For example, if an incubator is being developed in LA, could there be opportunities for alignment with the efforts happening with our, with our incubators or even other incubators? What, about outside the community system and into other academic institutions. So. Yes, absolutely. Contact us and we'd love to talk more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Ed Whitfield. Hi, Ed. Are you um, also exploring the potential of community owned businesses that are intentional about creating good jobs, but which have a broader base of ownership than worker cooperatives? So um, within the Worker Co op Academy, I don't think we had any multi-stakeholder, but I think that's what Ed is talking about, is um, creating multi-stakeholder cooperatives. 
Um, but it's something that is garnering a lot of interest and that we're trying to develop uh, legal models for and, and bylaws for um, and guides to how to create enterprises that are inclusive of multiple stakeholders in the community and, and share that ownership. Um, some other work I'm just going to do a, a plug is Selk is working on um, a securities law at the California state level that will enable communities to actually invest in local businesses and local enterprises. Right now, there's security laws where you have to, which highly regulates who can invest in what type of business. And so this will allow at least some um, opportunity for our communities to invest in their local local businesses. And so hopefully that can partly generate this development of worker cooperatives. So I don't know if you guys want to. I have a question. Oh, um, yeah. I think it would be great to have some training for existing co-ops and also people interested in co-ops more about decision making in the governance structure from the start, but also existing co-ops so that they can make smart business decisions. And what kind of uh, education happens in the academy that addresses that? Yeah. So. Um, uh, so we just have one more minute, so I'm just going to answer that and then we'll close, I think. Um, so the previous academy, we tried to incorporate all of this content into a 12-week course, which is pretty difficult. So what we're doing now, and this is um, Bill replicating the Green Worker Cooperative Academy in the Bronx, is that um, we are going to partner with a business education program that already exists here in Oakland. And so when they come into our academy, they will actually apply to both um, of those educational programs. So they'll be coming through our Worker Co-op Academy and we'll be focusing on um, you know, governance, management, and leadership, the legal piece, um, as well as people and culture, healthy communications within the cooperative. And they'll also at the same time be going through this business accelerator program um, that focuses in on you know, sales and marketing and product development and all those types of things. So um, as we move forward, that was one of the things that people, that was some of the feedback that we got was that um, there wasn't, there needed to be more about the business um, itself when we were focusing a lot on internal structures and, and those types of things. And so. then to follow up on that, we, the academy is 12 weeks, but then after that, um, we are doing ongoing business coaching. And that business coaching is usually centered around an issue or a project or a goal that they've self-selected, the team self-selected during the 12-week course. And then they also get follow-up legal counsel for three to four months on a wide variety of issues. Yeah. Great. So just in closing, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your busy days to join us here. You know, if you're in the Bay Area, we really hope that you will join forces with us to help make this vision a reality. Um, and if you are not in the Bay Area, we hope that what some of the things that we've done can be useful to you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Sign up for our newsletter so you can be um, on the announcement list of when things get released. Um, check back on our website and just stay in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everybody.